Hello everyone and welcome to the Profusion and the Godox board. Um, great to see our uh, vices coming in already. Excellent. My name's Andrew Hemming. I'm a photographer here in the UK. First off, apologies if you can see our uh, grid lines um, on the screen. Um, I seem to have lost my clean video feed out. I do apologize and hopefully it won't distract too much from the live uh, cast, but I really didn't want to hold up uh, proceedings um, with that. So the slides won't be affected by it. But thanks for taking the time to actually tune in. Great to hear from everyone. So the actual talk today is Small World, Big Magic. And that's all about tabletop photography, uh, close up and macro. And I really want to cover a few points about the details when we're actually looking at that style of photography. Now, we don't need a large studio when we're actually doing that style of photography. Um, all the pictures I'm about to show you were just taken on a regular um, kitchen table. And that really makes it um, uh, accessible to anyone, really. And uh, it's great to see a few people uh, coming in saying hi. Thanks very much for joining us uh, today. So macro and close-up photography. What are the issues that we actually have with that? Well, a couple of the challenges is with any photography is, is lighting. Often we're going to be photographing things and we're going to be very close to them. So what can that happen? Um, that means that the camera may well block the light that's actually falling on the subject. And it can be difficult to get lights in close enough if you're trying to use just a, a hot shoe flash gun the lens probably will block the light actually hitting that subject. So we want to overcome that. The other thing to bear in mind is that the focusing can also be an issue if we're actually looking at um, close-up photography and macro. The depth of field is much, much shorter than we have in regular photography. And that's something else we have to take into consideration. One way to try and overcome that, of course, is to use smaller apertures. But again, if lighting is going to be an issue for us, then it means we're going to use longer shutter speeds or higher ISOs. And that then can obviously affect the final quality of our image. So the solution is to look on um, some of the lighting solutions we have. Now, obviously, during the presentation, if you have any questions, please, you know, please post them and I'll certainly try and answer them for you. Um, there will be a time at the end as well, but don't hold back if you've got any uh, burning issues you'd really like to ask about. So normally when we've been looking at lighting solutions, it's often been a ring flash. That's what most people look at when they're considering macro photography. And that's an ideal uh, type of light if we want to capture detail. It is a, a, a flat light, which can be a, a, an excellent source of lighting, but it does have some creative limitations. Some uh, ring flashes, you can actually split the power output. So half the light could be turned off and half the light could be turned on, or you can lower and raise, but it's one single unit. And that, that can be a limiting factor if we want to try and be a little bit more creative in what we're producing. So I was really excited when I was given the opportunity to do a project with the Godox MF12 macro flash, which is the main one I'm going to be speaking about today. That flash gives us both uh, the ring flash option if we wish, and also a lens mount option. What I mean by that is, if we take my camera, for instance, we're actually going to mount the lens onto the front here. That way, the camera nor the lens is actually going to block the light onto the actual subject. So what does the MF12 look like if you haven't seen one? Well, here it is. It's quite a small unit. It has a built-in lithium battery, which is charged through the USB connection, which is ideal. It's very lightweight. Um, it's 144 grams or 15 ounces. So it's not heavy at all. We have a power button and we just rotate the dial to actually unlock the unit. Oops, let me try that again. If I turn the dial the right way, there we go, that helps. We can set the controls using the menu button here. 
and we can set group, we can set channels, and we can set all those various settings within the actual unit. And then we can actually see how the unit is set. Now, one of the other things it also has, which is a big bonus in my book, is this little button here. If we press that, it turns on our modeling light, which you can see is pretty bright. You can control the brightness of the modeling um, uh, lamp. Um, so you don't have to have it at maximum. You can raise and lower that if you wish. I'll speak a little bit more about the modeling light in a moment. So that's the actual unit itself. As I say, I won't go through all the menu options because normally once you've actually set it to a group and a channel, I would normally then be using one of the X series controllers. I use a, um, an X Pro and there I can have five different groups and you'll see how I use those to break up the lights and control them. But that's that would be my go-to controller and you will need that to be able to trigger um, your MF12s. So how do we actually mount the MF12 onto our lens? Well, with the MF12, we are supplied a set of rings. And these are the different filter sizes depending on the lens that you're actually going to use for your photography. And this will simply just screw on to the front of the lens. We then have a mounting ring. And all what happens is this slides into place. A very satisfying click. And then we have a little notch here and we just line up our MF12 and it slots into place. And then we have locking buttons that we can move the flash in any position. And of course we can then add additional flashes on if we wish. And we can add a total of six onto here to give us the traditional ring flash combination. Now, the MF12 doesn't come just on its own. It does have um, two light modifiers. One is a filter holder, and we have a set of color filters. Uh, it comes with a set of creative filters and a set of filters for uh, color correction. Um, and it's very simple. We just choose a color, oops, slot it into place, and that then clips onto the front and we can introduce color into our photograph. The other light modifier that we have is this extreme close-up positioning adapter. Now, what this does is it just clips into place. Live demonstration, always a dangerous thing to do. Uh, and the reason for that is if we've got the lens very close, to our subject, there's a possibility that we could maybe have a, a, a narrow gap that the, the flash may not reach. Obviously, this allows the light to spread and means we have no gap, even if the lens is almost touching our subject. The MF12 has a, a guide number of 16. Uh, which is pretty good for a unit of this size. But you have to remember, we're using these normally pretty close to our subject, so we don't need an awful lot of power. And sometimes, we, you know, you can have too much power and too much light, and that's the benefit of the, of the um, MF12. Of course, one of the big bonuses, and, and the thing that I found really exciting with the MF12, um, was actually this very small piece of plastic, uh, not the most exciting thing in the world, but what it allows us to do is if we put that, oops, if we put that onto the fitting, we now have a cold shoe. You can't trigger the MF12 through this, but it can go onto a hot shoe fitting, or it has a thread, which means it can go on to say, something like a mini tripod or a lighting stand or a full-size tripod. And because of the uh, cold shoe, we can use one of these little feet 
and we can tighten that down and it can be used off camera. So we can actually build a little um, macro studio using these lights. It really is quite interesting and hopefully I'll be able to show you some of the things I actually got up to with them. So the rechargeable battery inside gives approximately about 500 um, full power flashes. Obviously, if you're using the built-in uh, built LED light, that can have some uh, you know, battery power that will actually draw from that. Um, one of the issues, um, as I was saying before, can be the narrow depth of field that we have with macro photography. Um, and that's where the, oops, let me grab the other one, sorry. Um, that's where our modeling light can be a big help because it really illuminates the subject. So if you're really going for fine focus, that modeling light really helps. Of course, it is a modeling light. And as the word says, it allows us to model where the position of that light is going to be when we actually come to compose our photograph. And the other bonus would be if you're ever videoing and if you're doing close-up or macro video, you've got an excellent video light there. It can be uh, extremely bright. Uh, so all in all, it's a, it's a great little package. So let me uh, share with you some of my uh, images that we actually took with the MF-12. That's great. So, these were the three photographs that I was going to show you that was captured on the project I had. We have the ring photograph. I've chosen a jewelry item, some food, in this case, cake, one of my favorites. Um, I'm sure everybody likes cake. And uh, some flowers, some lovely orchids. Um, I'm going to start talking about the ring photograph because that was probably the photograph where I was actually able to build up the whole arrangement of images. Um, with, the, um, with this first photograph here, this first slide, oops, once it comes up, here we go, you'll see how the arrangement worked. I was using one single uh, MF12 and it was positioned just off center, about a 45 degree angle. And that gave me a straightforward shot of the actual ring. Now, doing this at home, I was using just some various bits and pieces that I found. The actual piece of um, slate that the ring is sitting on was just a leftover from um, a DIY project. Uh, if you notice, I've actually got, and let me show you on camera, uh, I actually used a plastic box to put the slate on top of. Um, you might be wondering why I chose to do that. Well, it's much easier once the um, actual box uh, was placed in position to actually place the slate on top, and then I was able to easily move my uh, position around. Also, if I wanted to place any light above or below, um, that would allow us to hide them easily out of sight. So we'll move on to the actual positioning and the actual picture that was captured. So here we see, this is the first photograph taken and this gives you a view of the lights positioned. It's quite a straightforward, nice record shot of the ring, and we can see all the detail within it. Now, what happens if I've only got one light and I want to do something additional, a little bit more creative? Well, I've decided to use a reflector. Now, this is a very simple reflector. I've just used a piece of um, kitchen file. The great thing about reflectors is that they'll never push back more light than the main light because they just physically can't. If you didn't want something as reflective as silver uh, or kitchen file, you could actually just use white card. Um, 
the only thing with reflectors is we can't actually control the power output that the reflector has. We can move it nearer and closer. That will allow us so much um, leeway, but not uh, an awful lot. So that would be an option if you're just starting with one single light. But to give us more control, I decided the best option was to add an additional light. So the light on the left, as we look at the camera, um, is our main light, and that's sitting it in its own group. And then the light at the one o'clock position is a fill light set to a different channel, and that meant I could control the power as I wanted. To make the photograph a little bit more interesting though, I decided to add a third light. So we're basically doing exactly the same as I would in a studio situation. So I wanted to position a top light, and I wanted that top light to be above and slightly behind the ring. The only problem was, was how to position that light there. So normally a boom arm, if you look at studio boom arms, they're normally quite large and they, um, they're quite a bulky thing because of the weight they have to take. But because of the weight of the actual um, MF-12, it wasn't necessary to have something that big. So I actually just used a, a, um, a holder for an umbrella and actually used a section. Um, let me just show you that. Let me just switch the camera over. And I just used a section of a lighting stand. Luckily, this had a, a quarter thread. Oh, let me try and make sure you can see that. A quarter thread. So again, I was able just to screw the uh, MF12. Whoops, there we go. The MF12 directly onto it. And that's how I actually made my own boom arm. As I say, because they're so lightweight, it's not an issue. I see we've got a couple of questions uh, have come in. Um, and someone was asking about the actual um, the actual settings um, for the shot where it looks like it's raining. I will get to that um, picture in a moment. The settings for all of these um, photographs with the rings was 250th of a second. My aperture was between f8 and f11. I varied it slightly um, just for personal preference. And my ISO was 200, which is the base level on the camera I was using. Um, let me just switch back to my camera just for a moment. Um, camera wise, I'm sure people have an interest about cameras. I shoot with Olympus, so I'm shooting on micro four thirds. So um, any focal lengths I'm about to give, um, you have to remember you need to double to have the same view as it would be on a full frame camera. So this was the uh, 60 mil macro. Uh, the view it gives me would be the equivalent to 120 mil. The reason I chose 250th of a second uh, and f8 and f11, um, one, the aperture was to do with the depth of field I wanted for focus purposes. Um, I went for my highest sync speed because I really didn't want any of the room light to affect the picture at all. I only wanted the light from my flashes to do that. Um, that way, I'm not worried about ambient light causing any issues. And certainly when you come to the shot that appears to be rain, um, I just wanted to be able to freeze that and the flash helped me to do that. So there we had the setup with three lights. As we can see, it helps light our background. I didn't actually need a, back, a physical separate background for this picture because the surface the ring was sitting on was long enough it stretched all the way into the background, and that meant I didn't lose any of the um, any of the slate or the stone that the ring is sitting on. Now, one of my favourite techniques when it comes to photographing almost anything, whether it's um, in the studio or outdoors, is I'm a big fan of backlighting. You know, the light coming through trees, anything like that. I think really adds. So. I thought, why don't we add an additional light at the back? And this was where I was able to use the adapter that you saw earlier. So I could use the um, MF12 off camera and a small stand just to hold the light. 
Because I was using the plastic box, my famous plastic box, it meant I couldn't see the actual backlight. But I think you agree that the actual difference it makes, it really brightens the picture up and starts to add an extra depth and a, a bigger element to the actual picture. So we could leave it there and that would be fine. But I considered we could go further with this and I wanted to do some more and not forgetting we've also got the option of adding colour. Colour is a way of altering the mood in a photograph. Uh, and so that's what I did. And on that background light, I added a blue gel. So the power setting had to be altered very slightly because you do lose a little bit of light. It depends on the strength of the, of the actual color gel or filter that you're actually putting in place. But the photograph started to get some atmosphere. Um, the nice thing was I wasn't really getting too much contamination on the ring. There's a little bit on the top and a tad at the bottom, but my main light and top light was actually helping to control that, which was excellent. But what could we do to go just a little bit further? Well, we could make that blue color stronger. And the way of doing that, I felt, would be to actually add some water onto the actual surface. So, um, all I did was used a small spray bottle. Oops, sorry, wrong side there. Um, with just normal, just normal water. I removed the ring and I just sprayed down the actual surface of the stone. And that really transformed the actual look of the photograph. One, we're getting a reflection into the picture. We're also getting highlights and shadows into the foreground and background. And it really, really makes that blue color really pop out. With reflections, remember that the, the nearer the camera is to the, to the actual surface that the item is on, the stronger the reflection will be. And because the camera wasn't really that high up looking down, that's why we got quite a strong reflection looking back. Um, and it really sort of added a lot to the actual photograph. So, was that going to be the end of it? Well, no. You've seen I've taken it one step further. And I decided it'd be quite interesting to introduce some movement uh, into the image. So, I reached for my trusty water sprayer. Now, I was surprised when I investigated there's so many options of being able to drip or spray water onto items in photographs. Uh, some of them are very elaborate and you can have timers and everything. Uh, but for what we were doing, I was just gonna use a simple sprayer. And that's what these photographs are actually illustrating. This was the sort of distance I was when I was using that. You can obviously adjust the amount of either jet or spray by twisting the nozzle on the front of the water sprayer. Now, obviously using this approach, um, there's a certain element of trial and error. You know, not every picture is gonna work and you're gonna adjust how much water or how little water you want to spray. It really is just trial and error. What I found though was to increase the chances of me of capturing a, a picture that worked was to actually set my camera onto continuous shooting mode. That way, I just increased the number of pictures I could capture during each spray onto the ring. I'd also recommend a towel and I'd recommend some kitchen roll um, because obviously every now and again, you've got to stop and just clean up because there's a little bit too much water everywhere. Because the camera was set on continuous mode, I would normally hold the water jet in one hand and I would just press down the shutter button with my other. I've, I've moved my hand out of the way so not to block it when the actual picture was being taken. And that way we capture plenty of images that we can then look back and choose what we feel is the best picture out of it. And then that's how we actually get this raining effect. Hopefully you can see how the picture was built up with the various elements and how we went from there. Um, let me just have a quick look back. Um, we have a question about the diffuser. 
Um, let me just have a look. Um, okay, interesting question. Thank you for this. Um, if you wanted more diffusion, um, what would I suggest? Well, if you're going to use, um, obviously, if you've got the MF12 on the ring, then this will also help diffuse the light. If you wanted even more, you could maybe get um, a very small shoot through reflector and possibly put that in between to actually increase the diffusion. Um, I found the light was, was, was pretty soft, particularly when I was using this on, on the actual um, unit. So hopefully, I don't know if that helps answer it, um, but really you could, you could use lots of materials as long as they're semi, as long as they're opaque, so you can actually shoot through them. It can be acted as a diffuser. So this was our final shot with the rings. Really, what's making this photograph work is the backlight. Without that backlight, we wouldn't get the effect we're getting with those droplets of water. When someone asked me about the shutter speed that I used, although I was on 250th of a second, which is the maximum shutter speed, or oh, sorry, maximum sync shutter speed for flash on my particular camera, what we have to remember is the ambient room light wasn't contributing anything to the photograph. It was purely flash. Now, depending on the power setting of the flash itself, that will be much shorter than 250 per second. It could be 10,000 per second because the flash duration can be incredibly short. So the actual picture was taken at 250th of a second, but the flash was probably light in the scene for a shorter period than that. And that's really how those droplets are actually caught, what appears to be rain, but as we all know, was just a water sprayer. But I know that's just between us and I know you won't share that with anyone else. Often, when we actually have a setup arranged, we can use that for other uh, subjects. We don't have to start from scratch. We don't have to reinvent everything. So what we have is a setup with two lights and a top light. And that could be used almost for any subject. And that's what I decided to do with my next image. And let me bring that up for you. And that's our cupcakes. Now, I'll be honest, the cupcake looked fairly uh, bland or plain. And I actually bought the extra bits of chocolate and these little, um, I. Sorry about that. Um, I just don't know what happened then. Um, sorry about that. We just seem to lose the picture for a moment. Right. Um, yeah, I am told these uh, metal balls are edible, um, which is reassuring, uh, considering I put them all over a cupcake. Anyway, as you can see, I'm using a very similar um, setup as I use for the um, rain picture. You can see a little bit more of my homemade boom arm. As you can see, that's just a bracket for holding a uh, umbrella, typically in a studio, uh, but I've actually used it to hold that piece of metal tubing. I've got my main light at the three o'clock position or on the right hand side, and I'm using the top light as a fill. Uh, so the top light on the lens as a fill. The lens on the boom arm is helping to give some um, highlight to the top of the chocolate uh, stars and also to throw a little bit of backlighting in. What you will see is I've actually uh, added uh, a V1 flash. Um, I did that so I was able to color our background. And let me just grab my V1 
and we can just show you that. So this is the Godox V1. And again, I just used the foot to hold that in place. Again, because it's wireless, it will just link into the whole system. And I was able to use that with the MF12s as well. So the MF12s do just link into the whole system. Let's get back to the photograph. Um, and I just used a, a blue gel. As you can see, the walls where the photographs were taken was white. So I didn't even, I didn't even need to worry about a backdrop. So the blue color you see behind the cupcake that was created purely from the, <coughs> excuse me, from the, um, from the gel on the V1 flash. The slight vignette effect on the background was accomplished by zooming the lens down probably to 70 mil or so. So I had a little bit of a hot spot and you get a little bit of a fall off and I used that to my advantage to actually create that look. As I was saying before, you don't always need um, to use a, a macro lens. Uh, this lens I'm shooting on now um, is actually a zoom lens. It's a standard zoom. Uh, it's a micro four thirds. So you have to remember when I say 12 to 24, that would be the same as a 24 to 80 mil. So very much a standard lens on that. Um, one thing also to bear in mind, if you are going to light your background and gel it, is to try and make sure that none of your other lights fall onto that background. That's why I position myself away from the wall. That way you don't contaminate or weaken the actual blue light that's actually lighting the background. One of the things we can do, because I had a zoom lens, which uh, you can see here, over the top of the actual setup of how it's all set, is we can easily, oh, what I was going to mention, sorry, just jumping ahead of myself, was again, my favorite uh, plastic box here meant I could easily hide that V1 out of sight for when I was actually lighting that background. So the box, and thanks to the cupcake, you can't see the light. Anyway, as I was saying, I used a zoom lens for this uh, photograph. And what effect we can get, I mean, I'm sure most of us have seen the movie Jaws. I know it's an old movie, but it was very popular, is the scene where um, I think the police uh, officer is sitting on the beach and someone shouts, shark. And we get this effect where the perspective alters on the picture. And they do that by moving the camera and zooming the lens. So as they move closer or further away, they zoom the opposite way. So the subject stays the same size, but the perspective on the picture changes. And I did that with these two photographs here. The picture on the left was taken very much with just a standard uh, length on the lens, probably around about 50, 60 mil. I then zoomed the lens wider and moved the camera slightly forward or because of my uh, plastic box, I was able to move the box closer and then just refocus. The backlight, uh, the top light, they just stayed where they were. And of course, the lens mounted lights on the, the, uh, the MF12, they stayed in position. So really the lighting didn't alter. One little tip, if you're ever looking at a photograph and you're trying to figure out, well, how did someone light this picture? How, how was that? Uh, accomplished it would be due to the fact that you can get real clues by looking closely at things like shadows and highlights now you can see the highlights on top of the chocolate stars will give you an indication that there's a top light and obviously the shadow around the bottom of the cupcake you can see also that there's some top lighting but the big giveaway of where the lighting was positioned is those little silver balls if you look at that you can see there's a main light off to the right and then there's a, there's a second light which is that top one that must be acting as a fill light so if you're ever trying to figure out how something was lit and that's often you know a mystery um Look for reflections. If it's a person, if it's a studio shot or an outdoor shot and it's got a person there, 
have a look at the eyes, look at the catch lights. That will often give you a, a good indication of what lights or reflectors we use for that. Uh, and I do that all the time. So now we have a situation where I decided that I wanted to photograph some flowers and I chose the orchids. Um, we can actually mount six um, MF12s onto that mounting ring. What I actually did with this picture was I split the photographs into two groups. So I had group A and group B, and that way I could control one set of lights on the right and then the other set on the left on the ring, and I could vary my light output. It's important, again, that I needed quite deep or quite a small aperture to get that deep depth of field to be able to capture all of the picture, uh, all of the orchids in the picture sharp. Um, one of the ways, again, as I said before, the modeling light really, really helps you get that fine focus. Uh, and again, if I'd been videoing, oh, it would have been superb light to be able to do that. I used, which I'll show you on this other slide, I used the V1 again. Um, and just to illustrate, if you don't have a, if you don't have a suitable white wall where you have your table, um, you can actually just use um, a white piece of card and that, and that will certainly help cover that for you. What we also have is um, the, the plants were actually in a, a glass bowl, so there was no need um, to actually raise them up. They were already high enough that I wouldn't be able to see the V1 in the background, and it was a suitable height for me to be able to work from. The V1 I've put into a separate group. That way, I can control the power of the background light, and as you can see on the photograph on the right, I've got the two groups that the um, MF12s are set into. That way I can easily adjust my power output. It makes life so much easier rather than having to go and adjust each light separately. I can adjust them all straight from the controller. And, uh, you know, it's, it just saves a lot of um, time if you just wanted to fine tune them. Don't forget, you've got five groups, so you can easily break them down more if you find that really is, is of help to you. Talking regarding focusing on something as, um, with, well, let me explain again. The orchids were in a situation where they were quite set deep within each other. They're not all on the same plane, if that makes sense. Some are sitting behind others. So how do we get that? Well, we can increase our depth of field by shutting our aperture down and shooting with a small aperture. Sometimes, though, we may not want to do that. Now, depending on what camera you have, we do uh, sometimes have the option of doing a thing called focus stacking. Now, focus stacking isn't on every camera. and You'd have to actually check your particular camera to see if you have that option. What it means is that the camera will take multiple images. Um, and what it does is, as it takes each image, it shifts the focus very slightly. So you end up with a group of photographs all taken at a different focal position. Then, depending on the camera, that can either be combined in camera or it can be done in software afterwards. Now, it does mean the camera could be taking maybe, I think it maybe starts from five, maybe up to 10 or maybe 15 pictures. Depends on how deep a, a focus you want and how fine you want those steps to be. But the camera needs to repeatedly take those photographs. The MF12 is great because of the lithium battery. The lithium battery recharges very fast. And particularly if you're using a group in a ring format, you'll find that it can easily keep up with the camera as it takes each picture. And it really works very well for that. As I've mentioned before, with the V1 and with a colored gel, we can work some more magic and change that background, which at the moment, as you can see, originally was white, and in this picture was blue. We can easily just change the gel that you can see, 
and we can change it to a totally different color. And that's what I did here. I actually swapped to a pink or magenta, however you wish to describe it. And that I chose to actually complement the actual color of the orchids. Some colors, like in the cupcake, we may want to contrast, and that will make our picture stand out. Uh, and others will just be looking, I thought, with the rain, I thought the blue really added to that. So I'm just going to come back to my camera. There we go. Sorry about that. Okay, so those were the three photographs I produced. And uh, if we've got any other questions, I'll be happy to answer those. What, what questions I have been asked previously by people was regarding when we're actually using, and if I just jump back to this picture, what happens when we put, oops, it's actually that one. Oh, it's actually that one we're after. What happens when you put this many flashes onto the end of a flash? Oh, sorry, onto the end of a lens, okay? So I'm talking about the photograph on the right-hand side where there's actually a group of MF trials mounted onto it, the actual gun. So the situation I found was it wasn't an issue at all. The Weight is only five ounces, it's, it's, six, it's 144 grams, and it really wasn't an issue for the lens. I found that most of my lenses have internal focusing, and because of that, um, the lens, when it's focusing, is just moving within the actual lens itself. There's no part outside turning. So it's not trying to drive the focus, or I'm not altering the focus, and then I'm also moving the weight of the actual lens is mounted on. It doesn't happen. Um, it, it, some older lenses have that, um, but I think most, mo most modern lenses probably have internal focusing, but it's worth actually checking on that because it could be a concern. But as I say, they're not a, it's not a heavy flash. You're not putting that much weight. Um, so not, not an issue at all as far as I was concerned. Someone also um, was commenting about the, the, the actual... Uh, rings that we have um, what happens if you've got a lens that doesn't fit the many <laughs> many filters you have um, that comes with the actual unit well amazingly um, I managed to have a lens uh, this is a macro but it's a tiny tiny lens this is um, only 46 millimeter which is really a small filter size um, the filter ring I used whoops excuse me was a 49 millimeter um, how did I get around that? Um, quite simple. I just used um, a stepping ring. Um, these are, you know, you buy these at many camera stores or online. They only cost a few dollars. They're not very expensive. And this allowed me to change uh, the 49, oops, to a 46. Um, normally they're used for filters. So if you've got a set of filters and you've got a different size lens um, and you want to use those same filters, that's normally what a stepping ring is used for, um, but that actually got around that problem at all. So that was really simple. Um, yeah, um, asking about the power of the MF12, it is, it is super tiny, it really, really is. I mean, um, in one ways, I really like that because Okay, I've shown it being used in a, a little mini studio situation, but really, you really can pop these lights in places. As I say, it's got a guide number of 16, um, and it is surprisingly bright. Uh, it, no problem at all. It really was such a, an excellent uh, amount of power. I didn't struggle. Uh, as I say, I was able to use whatever aperture I wanted um, and I had more, more than enough power. Um, I was probably using these on the actual shoot. Maximum was probably a quarter power. Um, they really do punch out an awful lot of light. Um, so yeah, really an ideal arrangement on that. Not a problem at all. Um, someone, um, hello Nelson. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, I used a 60 mil macro on the uh, ring shot. Um, so 
if we just jump back, let me just jump through the slides. The photograph of the rings, that was shot with a 60 mil macro. Um, that was probably the closest picture I actually took during this sequence. I could have gone closer, um, but I was starting to lose the ring. I was getting too close to the actual subject. That's what governed how close I actually came in to the actual position on that. The cupcake picture, that was taken, as I said, with the standard zoom lens. Um, many standard lenses and zooms will normally focus close enough that you can actually get um, you know, good close-up photographs. There are other options as well. If you haven't got a macro lens, you can use um, um, extension rings, once I remembered the word. Those will allow you to use a standard lens. It moves the lens slightly away from the camera body, and that will in uh, increase the distance uh, it can, or how close the distances the lens can focus. And you can also use um, screw on uh, close up lenses. That's another way if you haven't got a macro lens. Um, but for something like the cupcake picture, um, that was, um, oops, let me, there we go. So we can see that a little bit clearer. That was um, no problem at all, um, just with that lens. And I was actually able to zoom, as I said, and actually move closer to the actual subject. It really worked in my benefit for that. The orchid picture, um, I could have used a macro lens. I actually used a standard um, 50 mil lens for that. And that meant I was able to um, experiment with using a prime lens. A prime lens um, often commented, given us the, the sharpest image over a zoom. Uh, and that's why I actually chose on that. Um, so yeah, the the um, yes Nelson, the twelve uh, to forty, yeah, worked excellent. Um, it's probably one of my go-to lenses uh, for for most types of photography. Um, it really works well, and that's that's the shot I actually use for that. Um, as far as the focus stacking option, um, yeah, good question. Um, I found personally. Um, that the actual camera, the, you can actually set a delay if you don't think your flash can keep up with the actual unit. I didn't have to do that. Um, they were recycling almost instantaneously. Um, but you'll normally find with focus stacking, you'll have an option of, of telling the camera how long to leave between each picture if you have a flash that you think will need to be given time to recycle, to fully recharge. But because if you're using a group of, say, six of these MF12s, um, the amount of power, uh, as I say, it's, it's, it's probably, you're going to be on for that orchid picture, maybe an eighth or sixteenth power, um, and they recharge instantly. They come back so quickly. But check on your actual camera, but most of them will have an option for how long you can set for that. Um, the gels, um, should, should we use the gels for the MF12? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, um, I, f I found the, the gels really a great addition. Um, because the flash head itself of the MF12 is quite small, and, uh, Godox are pretty generous with the, with the range of, uh, with the range of, of colors and combinations that I actually had, and there are, there are more. Um, you don't need to necessarily buy large amount of gel, even if there was a color there that you couldn't actually find. The gels really can really transform your photograph. Uh, and that's all the backlighting that you saw, whether it was background, whether it was the, the um, blue color in the um, ring shot with the water, the rain shot, that was all accomplished just through using blue gels or magenta gels. I could have changed that color to anything I wanted if I'd wanted purple rain hence the Prince song uh, we could have easily done that just by changing the actual gel color um, gels um, I don't think you should underrate gels it saves an awful lot of money than having to buy different color backgrounds we can use that and just gel a light and just light a white background certainly for a, a small studio setting uh, it's ideal for doing that it, it's not a problem at all um and the um 
Godox F, um, V1 that I used, um, I've actually got the kit. I was able to use the, the magnetic holder. That meant I was able just to pop a gel in. The, again, it does come with some gels, the V1, um, but I wanted to add a, a different color in there. So I just used the magnetic holder and that held the gel in place. And that really just simplified it. The reason I used the V1 was I just wanted to make sure I had sufficient power for lighting that background. Um, I should have maybe experimented using a, an, an, an MF12 for lighting the background. It probably would have been bright enough. But I just work on the theory that, you know, most people have got a hot shoe gun. So if you've already got that, why not put it to use? Um, again, because all the wireless system connects together, it really makes it so much easier to control all of those lights together. So I hope that's given you a good oversight uh, on the MF12. Don't forget, you will need one of the X controllers to trigger the MF12. There isn't any way, uh, although there is, as I say, there is what can be placed onto a, a hot shoe style fitting, such as one of those, you will need a trigger to be able to fire the actual flash. But you can alter the settings. Let me just pop that on. You can actually alter, if I can get it to focus for us, you can actually go in there and alter the power settings and you can set things such as uh, the TTL manual and such like. You can also alter the um, identification number, um, which you can use if you're wanting to uh, photograph with someone else and you're both using the same system and you're finding that you both don't want to be on channel one, you can actually move that off. Um, the identification number could be if somebody else was trying to use your lights by copying your channels. Um, I've never had that situation. Uh, I've never had anybody so mean that they're actually trying to steal my, steal my light, so to speak. But it really, really helps on that. I would definitely say they're worth investigating uh, because the options really are so wide. These would be so easy to take outdoors and use. So you don't necessarily, even if you're going to go out and photograph insects, um, again, in that situation, I probably wouldn't use manual um, control. I probably would use TTL. And that way, if you're using a fast-moving subject, it would certainly give you the ability to capture them very quick and actually have the lights there ready to go. And again, using the um, extreme close-up positioning adapter, you really could get close to insects. For that type of photography, you really are going to need a macro flash and a macro lens to do that type of photography. But uh, I certainly hope uh, it's given you some ideas on that. So, if I have any more questions or anything else uh, for that, I'm certainly happy to try and answer those for you. Um, I really would like to thank Godox for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk about my experience of using the um, MF12s. Uh, um, I was really lucky to be able to try them out. Excellent light, really recommend them. If you want to actually see them in action, there is a um, short film on YouTube on the Godox channel and there um, you'll see all three setups and you'll actually see the photographs being taken in real life and again I give a, a little bit of a brief overview of the system again so if you want to see uh, some video certainly do that if you want to see a little bit of a better quality image than you may be able to see on the live stream um, those um, three images are on my Instagram feed um, and my Instagram is Andrew M Hem, oh, sorry, Andrew M H sixteen. Um, not the most catchiest, probably of uh, names, um, but that's uh, that seemed the easiest one for me to go to. So it's Andrew M H sixteen, and I've put up those um, three pictures if you actually want to see the actual detail. So. Oh, how, how does it compare to the V1? Uh, okay, let's, I'll try and answer this question. Um, how does it, okay, Dave, how does it compare to the V1? Totally different, very, very different light um, compared to, um, yeah, the power-wise, yeah, the, um, the, the V1 is obviously going to be more powerful 
than here. The problem, as I was saying at the very start, was if you have this mounted, oops, mounted on a, a on a on on camera, then the lens is probably going to block the light if you're trying to light with this. These lenses really, uh, so these flashes are really designed to get in close. And that's the real benefit of them. But you can use them with another light, like the V1. You're not just limited, um, that they're, they're, they're standalone. They can actually be done that way. Anyway, thanks for uh, tuning in and uh, spending some time. I hope that's given you a little bit more of an insight into the actual lights. And uh, don't forget, please uh, check out the Godox um, YouTube channel and look for those videos. Uh, there's plenty more, and there are some more presentations coming up here at ProFusion Expo um, over the next day. And they will obviously go into more detail on more of the Godox range of products. Uh, and thank you very much, and uh, have a good day, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.